Hey folks, welcome to the Field and Garden Podcast. I'm your host, Lisa Mason Ziegler, and I hope you consider me a friend because, friend, I just feel like we meet here and we're just like friends, right? So I promised um, in a previous podcast that I was going to sit down with each and every one of our instructors of our big school courses and go through their syllabus, better known as the outline, of their course with the instructor. And to do that so that we would have a better understanding of exactly what is included with the course, what kind of things you're going to learn about, and just the depth of of the information and the knowledge and the wisdom that is shared in our course. And so I sat down today with Steve and Gretel Adams of Sunny Meadows Flower Farm. They're located in Columbus, Ohio. And, you know, I've known these two for over a decade, and it has been such a pleasure to watch them grow their farm into this amazing flower I don't even know what to call it. Their farm, they just have so, they have their fingers in so many different areas, but yet now they're fine tuning in on some things and getting, um, I mean, it's just, it's pretty amazing to have sit as a front row seat to watch them develop this business. That is just so amazing. And so today um, we focused in on the syllabus of their course. Their course um, is called It's in the Flower Farming School series, and it's called Growing Cut Flowers in Hoop and Greenhouses. And y'all, you just can't imagine the depth of information. So let's take a listen to Steve and Gretel going through their syllabus. Hey, folks. So I am here with Steve and Gretel Adams of Sunny Meadows Flower Farm. Hi, guys. Hey, Hi. thanks for having us. Hey, it's my pleasure. And as we have promised that we are going to be going through the syllabuses of all of our online courses with the instructors so we can kind of get those little nuggets of why, you know, what's in here and giving us a little bit more of the why and how and when and all that kind of good stuff. So that's what Steve and Gretel and I are going to do for you today. So the name of their course is Growing Cut Flower Crops in Hoop and Greenhouses. And y'all, I just have to say, you do realize that Gretel and Steve, how many structures do you have now? The last time I talked to you, you had 17, but I think you've added more. Mm, I think we're at, at 17. We're at 18. 18, yeah. <laughs> One of them's a big, like, three-bay structure that we just added. So we had to, like, renumber all of them. So <laughs> it, was, it's a, it was a little unclear, I think, the last time we talked, but officially it's, it's 18, yeah. Yeah, so... Um, So that's really, I mean, I just am so excited for everything you guys are doing. And so let's get down to this syllabus here. So what the syllabus is, if anybody doesn't know, this is basically the the table of contents that go with their course. And the course is dripped out over six weeks. And each week you get several hours of sessions, lots of little sessions. And that's what we're going to be talking about is exactly what is included in this course and what you can expect to learn. So in the beginning, of course, there's a welcome and Steve and Gretel introduce themselves. Um, and so then we're going to start with week one, um, which has kind of got a, an overhead Um, title of Decision Making and Planning. Um, So week one is titled Structure Types, Location, Deconstruction, and Construction. Wow, that's a mouthful. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry about that. Yeah. (laughs) But they're really going to simplify this for us, y'all. So in session one, the title is Low Tunnels, Caterpillar Tunnels, and Other Versions of the Woolham House. So Mm -hmm. first off, what the heck is a Woolham House? Well, the, the, the original idea came from Bob Wollum. So that's, it's a, it's a caterpillar tunnel. Um, he used to like tootsie roll the ends and have it like pulled with tension. Um, it's made out of PVC. Yeah. So I guess if you count those, that'd be 20 
structures total because oh. we've got two two bays that's basically our lily house so it does not hold snow it's um just to protect from too much rain um oh. so we do all our all our lilies and crates so it just is basically talking about the different the different types of structures you know all the way i think people sometimes see um our production and they're like wow that's way more greenhouses than i want to do or where do you start so it just is kind of like you know even we still have a house that's made of pvc so like you don't have to start with a big like gutter connect house or with a heated house even so it kind of starts from the beginning of like sort of the cheaper options and then works its work its way up in the options as far as like what is you know more expensive um with yeah the types of structures you can choose and so for anybody that doesn't know, Bob Woolham is one of our rock stars in the gar in the cut flower growing world. And um, Bob has been innovative in um, a lot of different ways. So that's really cool. I never, cause I don't do houses. Um, I never heard it called the Woolham house before. All right. We've, so got a couple houses, we've got a couple houses that we've gotten from other people when we tend to name that house after the, the last name of those, those people. Yeah. So. Well, that's cool. Yeah, help carry that on on our farm. Yeah. <laughs> and so session two is hoop houses slash high tunnels, aka hoop ties. Is that what? How do you say that? Hoopties. Hoopties. I was going to yeah. say that. I thought, okay, <laughs> hoopties. Um, and these are three or four season structures. So tell us what in the world is a hoopty. So basically, there's they can the three or four season structure depending on how many bows you put up and how far apart the bows are but these are basically just unheated tunnels so you know they can be we call them hoop the ones that we call hoop these are we have an, an amish guy that bends the posts for us so it's kind of like a homemade version of one you can buy from a greenhouse company yeah. so when we started with the hoop con these structures hoopties we had two structures that we had spaced the bows farther apart with the anticipation of um, taking the plastic on and off uh, off in the winter so that it could snow in there uh, leach out the soil clean the soil add fresh water um, and then we put the plastic on in the spring summer and fall um, so that's kind of where the idea of hoopty came from for us um, so just kind of a cheap, hmm. cheap version. <laughs> Nothing. That's called cost effective, not cheap. Yeah. Right? Yeah. All right. So session three is heated greenhouses and gutter connects. Yeah. You want to talk about those real quick? Um, yeah. So um, once we kind of had a few structures that were unheated, we wanted to transition into having stuff earlier in the spring. Um, and so we started to convert our unheated hoops into heated greenhouses. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about, we'll talk a lot about heating greenhouses, you know, seed house, all that kind of stuff. Okay. And so session four is considerations, ventilation, automation, utilities available, monitoring, 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 I can't even say the word systems, location and drainage, et cetera. So this is about basically taking care of your houses, right? Keeping them yeah. going. Yeah, this is um, this is keeping the environment inside the house optimal for growing. Um, um, and whether that's automated or manual systems, um, you know, water in the greenhouse can be a big deal. So drainage around the greenhouses will we'll go over and, and talk about a lot of that stuff too. And some of the things we learned the hard way of like, you know, putting a greenhouse where it shouldn't be and then having to build drainage around it, you know, just things to consider of like where you're going to put it um, makes a difference. I would imagine that like in any job, people, when they get it, are quick to perhaps choose that wrong location and until you've lived through, like you said, trying to get water out of something. Yeah, that is like a huge, say, learning curve to learn from somebody that already learned, right? Yeah. <laughs> And, you know, when I look at your list here for that session, it's like when you see it down on paper, um, there's definitely a lot to learn. 
You know what I mean? It's like things you just don't even think about. Ventilation. I mean, I'm sure people think, oh, well, I'll just roll up the sides. Well, when? For how long? You know, Mm -hmm. that's awesome. All right. So session five, where to buy and tips for deconstruction of a used structure. Oh, wow. I have heard so many people talking about buying used structures. So what are, what kind of little tidbits are you giving them in there? Well, I mean, we've bought probably six structures used from different people. Um, you know, it's, it's about knowing the right people from the farmer's market. Maybe somebody that's about to retire. Um, um, that's how we got the Ashworth houses. Um, just networking with other growers and, pe- and letting people, putting it out to the world. Hey, I'm looking for used greenhouses. Um, driving around, I, I got one from an old, when we first moved here, an old, uh, like a plant land nursery store. Um, and this greenhouse had just been sitting in the back. And that was our first structure that we actually, um, I think even put up, we tore down, put up, um, and then we, um, added to it even, but yeah, I but think- the tips just talking about things to think about things that we've learned in the process of deconstructing a greenhouse, you know, like how to just making sure you're taking lots of pictures and, you know, m- making notes about how things go together. Cause every, every greenhouse kit is different. Like we just did one a couple years ago and it was all like nuts and bolts instead of being tech screws. So that was like a lot more pieces to keep together. And so just talking about kind of how we find them use and also like our suggestion is to maybe like put up a new one first so that way you know the steps and then oh. find used ones because if used ones come without a bunch of parts then you don't know what you're missing so if you start with a new one then you can at least like get familiar with what the steps should be and what you're looking for and then you'll have more experience to be able to like you know, problem solve on the used ones. Cause there's always things that are missing or parts that you have to replace. Something was concreted in, you can't pull it out, like things like that. And I don't, and so, you know, it kind of takes having a little bit of knowledge to, to know what you're looking for in a used structure also. That's a good point. And that's an excellent suggestion. So session six and session seven are um, steps for construction. You have part one and part two. So is that construction of a new house or just houses in general? I would say houses in general. Um, We're talking about new houses, but it's the different steps that you would take for constructing a, a used house also. Okay. And then of course, um, so each at the end of each week, um, you get a live Q and a session with Steve and Gretel, um, to get your questions answered that you've submitted. Um, and this is the place that, you know, if there's some burning question that you have that wasn't covered, perhaps this is the place where you're going to get that answered. And the bonus is previous years classes, Um, recorded Q&As are also in the course. So your course, you get to look back and see what the Q&A was from the year before. So that is really, or all the years before, that's pretty awesome. So that's the first week, you know, they're going to explode your brain basically with all of this (laughs) construction information. Um, And then week two, which is class two, um, is creating a successful plan of action, crop planning, sales outlets, and seed starting. And they've got some handouts in there. Um, So session one is considerations for crop decision making. So what in the world would that be? So basically just like you're not going to get a tunnel and plant sunflowers and zinnias in there. Like that's not the objective. The objective is to extend the season, which for us in our zone means that you need to grow things that can tolerate short days or, you know, lower temperatures. And so just thinking about the real the real estate is the most expensive, you know, in, especially in a greenhouse. Um, And so just like making sure that you're growing the most profitable. There you go. There, Yeah. All right. Session two is crop planning, first steps, sales projections and budgeting. 
Yeah. So that's just thinking about what, where you're going to sell these flowers. So if you're starting a farmer's market that doesn't start until June, then you don't need to like extend your season to have flowers in April if you don't have an outlet. So if you're extending the season, then just figuring out, does that mean, you know, your farm stand opens earlier? Does that mean, you know, you're selling to weddings? Like what is the, what's the plan for these flowers coming out of the greenhouses that are yeah, just making sure that you know, you know where they're going to go. Sure. And, you know, that makes such good sense because, I mean, I don't know about y'all, but how many growers have I heard from that plant a boatload of tulips? And guess what? They bloom in March and April here in the South and their farmer's market doesn't start till May. What you going to do with them? <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. so that's, you know, it seems so obvious to us that now have all these years of experience, but you know, when you're going in, you just have no idea. So that's a great one. All right. Session three, crop scheduling and greenhouse planning. So that just kind of goes along the same lines of, of the, the crop planning situation. So thinking about, you know, if you want flowers for Mother's Day, when does that mean that you need to plant them? And, and when we go through the specific crops in the future weeks, um, we do talk about each crop and like the week numbers that we would plant okay. things, um, like specifically by crop. So this is kind of just talking about the scheduling process, our planning process, and kind of how we get to that point of when we know we need to start things. Okay. And then session four is sales outlets and pricing. Yeah. So that's just another thing talking about sales outlets, you know, so like it's, you want to make sure that you can get the money per stem that you know that you're putting into it. Um, and, you know, something like grocery store sales for us is something that we do a lot in the summer with our field crops, but not as much in the winter time with our heated greenhouse crops. You know, they just cost too much to produce to be worth it to sell it to a grocery store for $5. So just taking some of that into like consideration. Right. You know, whereas our like ranunculus to florist is 18, which means retail needs to be like $25 a bunch or something right. to make sure that there's enough space like to mark it up the florist. And so I know this is a great subject. Session five is enterprise budgets. What is an enterprise budget for those so people? That, that, could be like, that could probably be a whole class on its own, but um, <laughs> it's tracking all of the things that you're, all of your inputs um, and then the, with your planned sales outlets and pricing and calculating what the actual profit per square foot is for that crop. Um, so we went through and did an enterprise budget for each crop in the greenhouse just to make sure that it was, um, that we were putting things in there that made sense. Um, so, and that's how we learned, you know, some of the spacing needed to change in order to cram more in, like with the stock and the snaps. Um, things like that are all, all information that we gathered from the enterprise budget. So you actually calculate, you know, the number of hours it takes somebody to seed it and water that tray and how many weeks it's in the greenhouse and, and heating and, and everything. It accounts for all of those like inputs. So it's a lot of work, the enterprise budgets, but, it, and you need a few years of data gathered in order to do them. So it's not something that you necessarily want to start with right away. Cause you've got to, you've got to figure out how long does it actually take you to see the flat? How long does it take you to harvest that bed and process those flowers? Right. And stuff? right. Take some data gathering, but that's just another tool that we use to make sure that what you're putting in the greenhouse is worth, worth it. Well, I think it's beneficial to learn about that early on to be gathering or at least being aware of it as you're moving into that time that you might need to do it. You know what I mean? To go four years and look, learn about it and say, oh, gosh, I should have at least been keeping track of X, Y, Z. So that's a great one. All right. Session six, seed starting, plant popping and recording. So here we talk, um, we'll go into detail about how we seed start, um, the most efficient ways for us to seed start kind of some potting soil and stuff like that. Um, but then we're, we talk about recording. So 
that's collecting your data so that you can use the next year um, in your enterprise budget. So recording everything that you seed, how much of each flat, um, how many flats of each variety you seed, um, and, and getting that information. And, 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 and in that recording, you could time yourself. Like it took me, you know, an hour to see 35 flats or something or 25 flats. So, so you can collect that data. Um, so we'll go into that a little bit. And then their session seven is propagation. Yep. We'll talk about uh, propagating dahlias, woodies. Um, oh, cool. Okay. Let me see. Other stuff too. I think mums are in there too. Mums, yeah. geraniums. Things that we keep uh, stock plants of um, in the in the heated space to grow out for future years. Oh, that's awesome. Okay. So, and then again, of course, at the end of week two, there's a Q&A session, the live coaching session with Gretel and Steve. And so now, um, so we've been in part, both of the first two sessions are a part of the decision making and planning. Now we're in part two, um, which is crops to grow. And so class three is about spring blooms, both heated and unheated production. And then of course she has handouts. Um, the ranunculus and the anemones. And so session one is ordering and sourcing ranunculus. That seems pretty straightforward, but I guess nothing is really straightforward, is it? Yeah, I mean, what's happening right now with, you know, so the supply and demand and in, the, in, I mean, in every industry, but also in the floral industry is that, or people are getting orders in really early. And so stuff is selling out. So just talking about, the timing of getting getting your orders in mostly is what that's about. Okay. And then session two is ranunculus growing and harvesting. So that seems pretty straightforward. Um, but it's I'm sure everyone wants to learn about. So that's us talking about all our different successions, heated and unheated. So, you know, we sell ranunculus corms also. So we've been getting a lot of questions about I'm in this zone, what does that mean? And kind of right. like adapting for everybody's climate. So um, yeah, so this is answering all the questions about that of, you know, if you want them to bloom at this point and you're in this zone. So we talk about our zone specifically, but everything can be adapted to, you know, to where you are, if you're zone warmer, maybe you plant a little bit warmer because a lot of these cool weather crops can like shut down if it gets too hot. So you don't want to wait until too late right. in the spring to plant them. Um, for us, ranunculus is usually done after Mother's Day. So if we get into the end of May and we still have ranunculus, that's bonus time for us. So we've been having people asking us about, you know, could they get it blooming in June and like if you're any warmer than us, I don't know if that's, yeah. That's a, yeah a good it's a dream. We yeah. can all dream. <laughs> yeah. All right. So session three is anemone growing and harvesting plus corn saving. Yeah. So anemones and ronculus, you know, are pretty similar in the way that they're, they're treated. Um, but we're also talking about our ranunculus saving. So, um, you know, as the, as the supply, as the demand grows in the floral industry, our goal is to be more of our own supplier. So um, working through kind of figuring out what we've learned about corn saving, there's not a lot of information out there because the suppliers want you to buy new ones every year. And so it just has kind of been like learning through, learning through doing, we call the ranunculus, uh, the dahlia tubers of summer because they take <laughs> <laughs> They're just as much work as dividing dahlia tubers and stuff, but hopefully it'll be worth it in the long run when we can supply our own ranunculus. Sure. And so I don't have yeah. know how to pronounce this name. It's session four, O-R-N-I-T-H-O-G-A-L-U-M. I say ornithogalum. Other people say ornithogalum. I think it just okay. depends on. I think I'm just what. not going to say it. <laughs> yeah. Star, star of Bethlehem is what florists okay. call it. Um, um, and pre-chilled really tulips is also in that same session. Yeah. So those are things that we grow in crates in the heated house. Okay. So those, they have kind of similar needs. So that's why they're grouped together. Okay. And so pre-chilled tulips, you also grow unchilled tulips, don't you? Or do you? 
I, yeah, we do. So we grow our, our the standard tulips go out in the field. Pre-chilled tulips are what go in the greenhouse. So they have been okay. um, conditioned like they've already gone through winter. So basically when they come to us, they're ready for rooting and then, and then blooming out. Um, kind of similar to what people do with lilies, you know, where they buy right. them already like programmed. So that helps us extend the tulip season so that we have tulips coming from the greenhouse for about a month or so a month or a month or two before the outdoor tulips are ready okay so session five is snapdragons and you mentioned earlier that you learned from your enterprise budgeting that you needed to pack them in a little tighter right yeah. so that's, that's yeah awesome. and snaps are something you know they come in different groups like the series and stuff so there's certain ones certain varieties that you plant at certain times um, so this is just kind of going over our, our favorites and kind of the timing that we figured out. Okay. And then session six is stock. Yeah. Which is another one that people, people like, like to learn about one of the best smelling things on the farm, we think, but, um, yeah, so that's just talking about variety and timing again so mostly the spring stuff you know we're talking all about hitting those floral holidays so for us we need greenhouses in order to hit easter and mother's day and mother's day being the biggest holiday but easter starts the season out and so all these spring things you know we're talking about what would the timing be in order to hit those holidays okay and then dusty dusty miller i would guess Oh yeah. Yep. Dusty Miller. Yeah. Just the foliage. One of the foliages that we grow, um, in the greenhouse, another good thing you can have for holiday time. And something that, that does better, you know, Dusty, Lysianthus, these are crops that just grow better in a greenhouse during the summertime. Right. right. So. All right. And then session eight is poppies and delphiniums. Yeah, so we tried to just like cover all the things you could grow. Um, there's some things that we no longer grow that we talk about in the class, like delphiniums. And the next week, session nine is about sweet peas and early sunflower trials. So those are things that got cut this year, but it's all just about the, what the possibilities are, you know, and we also like have talked with other growers who you know, they do trials of other interesting things. And it's like, you just don't know until, until you try it. So right. it's always changing a little bit what, what we're doing. It's what keeps it interesting. Well, not only that is too, it's where your business is, you know, it's like what your volume is, what your target is, all that matters. And so session nine in this week's is the sweet peas and other early sunflower trials. Mm -hmm. So so yeah. you share so those trials, right? Yeah. Yeah. And they worked for the holiday, but then we just decided that it wasn't like worth the space in there. It gets pretty tight for us in the, in the house that has crates that are heated. Um, and so, yeah, in prioritizing, you know, sweet peas and the sunflower trials were what got the cut. So, yes. Yeah. All right. So now we're moving into week four. Um, which is blooms for the summer and fall. And so, you know, what I have to just keep reminding myself of as we're doing this, and we're just talking about growing in houses. So you grow a lot of this stuff or some of this stuff also outdoors, right? Do you grow Lizzie outside at all? No, no. Okay. All, all of ours are inside, okay. but yeah, there are, there are some of the crops. Well, I'd say Dahlias. Everything, everything we've talked about so far, spring stuff, that's all inside. So you can do dusty outside, but we don't. We've tried a few times. It doesn't get as big. Right. You can do snaps outside, but we don't in the summer. We grow them mainly in the shoulder seasons. Delphiniums, same thing. Yeah. So there are options, but you know, as far as the crops that take a lot of work, it's like the the loss that you would have if it rains at the wrong time outside. Right. That's why we've never never done Lizzie's outside is just um, yeah because they take so long and they're so they're an expensive like input and um, so for us we the Lizzie's can go into like those three season structures you know that aren't or unheated structures they don't need that much. Um, special care, but it's just about those petals getting rained on. So that's what mm -hmm. I think the blooms for summer and fall, a lot of the stuff is 
is like that, you know, like the Lizzie's, they don't want to get rained on. Same with the lilies. You know, we just had issues with, with botrytis, with them getting um, rained on at the wrong time. So sometimes okay. my funnels are for season extension and sometimes they're, you know, just for crop protection. Right. So session one, two, and three in week four is Lysianthus. So session one, you talk about seeds, plugs, and ordering. I get more questions about how and when to order Lysianthus plugs. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Order them as soon as you can. And we suggest plugs, but we do talk about starting seeds as well. Okay. And then the session two is the potting up, transplanting and netting them. Yeah. So that's something else that, you know, they just take a lot of care. So that's why Lizzie's were, are split up into multiple sessions. And that was something when we, started that Dave Dowling said, you know, at our first conference, if you don't take anything away from this conference, grow Lysianthus. Yeah, we did. And ever since then, we've grown more every year and can still sell everything that we can grow. So it's one that was worth taking multiple sessions to talk about. <sighs> and then session three, you talk about harvesting and bunching that. I mean, it, you just really give them everything they need from beginning to end to grow great Lizzie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what that's what we're trying. Yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot of details that we've figured out. So yeah, and yeah. then session four is Lily's program. So for someone that doesn't know what a programmed Lily is, what does that mean? So similar to like what we're talking about with the pre-chilled tulips, just that they've already gone through winter. So that means we can get lilies every two weeks. You know, plant them, plant them out, and they take about ninety days. So. It just is so that you can make sure for us, we put a lily in every bouquet. So it's important for us to have lilies consistently throughout the season. Program is just a fancy way of saying schedule. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. So your supplier freezes them, right? And they think they're in winter and then they get shipped to you. And if you don't put them in a cooler, then they think, oh, it's time to get busy growing, right? I mean, mm -hmm. that's pretty much the bottom yeah. line, right? Yeah. All mm -hmm. right, session five, eucalyptus and begonias. Your yeah. begonias are really beautiful. Oh, thank you. Yeah, we um, just try to have interesting foliage options. You know, I think that that's something that um, florists buy a lot of. Um, so just more more things you can grow in the tunnel for that. And then heirloom chrysanthemums is session six. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, we're in, we're in mum season right now. So just talking about some of the, some of our favorites and um, also netting is really important with the mums. So just talking about some of the care, cutting them back and things like that. And disbudding, right? Do you disbud? <laughs> we do. Yeah. yeah. We, we, um, this was our first year kind of actually having um, a schedule or a program for disc budding. And uh, the crew would go out there on Fridays for uh, two or three weeks and just kind of keep going through disc budding on Friday afternoons. Yeah. So we awesome. don't go down to one single bloom like competition mom growers would. So it's kind of somewhere in the middle where we're making sure that there's some big blooms. But three to also, five. Yeah. Wow. But also yeah. Not, All right. Not so fun. session seven, which I'm sure is a big one, is dahlias early and late in a house. That seems yeah. really important. Yeah. So that's we're trying to figure out you know, how to extend the dahlia season. So by taking cuttings, planting them early and late in the greenhouse, that help, helps extend the season. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. And then session eight is post frost flowers. Mm hmm. Which is where we're at uh, right, right now. now. Yeah. Um, so just trying to figure out what else can you have, you know, because I think for us, we got to the end of the season and it was flowering cabbage was what was left in the greenhouse. And so and we had, had to find some supporting items. Yeah. So we've been focusing a lot on having marigolds for the different uh, holidays in October and November and um Gumfrina, but yeah. I would say marigolds is kind of where we're yeah marigolds mums yeah okay uh, yeah. 
All right. And so this brings us, so we're now done. We're through with um, what we're calling part two crops to grow. Now we're moving into greenhouse management. So as a big overview, the course um, is broken into three sections and each section has two weeks of classes. So we're now in greenhouse management. It's called caring for the plants environment. There's some great handouts. Um, and then right in session one, setting up the seed house, maximizing space and time. So that's the house that you start seeds in, right? Correct. Yep. And so, um, you know, we talk about different layout options for that. But, you know, like Gretel said earlier, the greenhouse is the most expensive real estate. And I would argue that the seed house is by far the most valuable because you have thousands more plants in there. Um, so we kind of talk about uh, maximizing space and, and making it efficient workflow. Okay. And then session two is bread, bed prepping or bed prep. Yep. And so we'll go over how we prep our beds. Um, you know, the steps that we take, we do semi raised permanent beds in the greenhouses. Um, so we'll talk about that, but we're also going to other options. And then session three is watering and irrigation. Yep. All these things, um, we have spent a lot of time trying to dial in. Uh, we've learned by making a lot of mistakes by overwatering, underwatering at times, but we tend to overwater more than we underwater. Um, and so we kind of go into the details of, of at what stage you want to water something, um, how dry you want to let it get in between waterings. Um, and that is all around plant health, you know, trying to keep the plants okay. being soggy. And so netting, I would guess, is that support netting or house pest yep. netting? That would be um, support netting. So okay. you know, we do net all the crops in the greenhouses because they get so tall. Um, we don't do, we don't net anything in the field anymore, um, but we do net stuff in the greenhouses. And, you know, I think the assumption of, you know, new and up and coming greenhouse growers is they think, oh, you don't have to net in a greenhouse because there's no wind and no rain. Well, there's other problems that are a problem in a house that aren't a problem out in the field, right? Yeah, you know, they, they, they tend to get taller. You know, the plants get taller. Um, and they're um, not developing that wind resistance. You yeah. know, like stems are stronger because it's windy out there. Right. So like, and then they're not as strong and then it just takes one, one gust to like knock it all over. Yeah, our, our farm 10 minutes down the road is in an open field surrounded by cornfields. Uh, and it's always windy over there. And we never have an issue, I think, just because the plants are, are you know, strengthening themselves right. and staying upright. Building that resistance. All right. So session five is cover crop and resting beds and rotation. Yeah, this is another thing that... Um, you know, is, is important for us outside. And so we try and implement that in the greenhouses. Um, and so it can be kind of difficult figuring out how to cover crop. And, you know, one of the hardest, we talk about it being uh, expensive real estate in the greenhouse, but then you're taking beds out of production to rest them. So, so just kind of, we go over the different things to think about when, when you need to cover crop or rotate or rest. Sure. And then session six is maintenance and ventilation. Yep. Another the know. biggest, this is the, the ventilation I would say is the most important thing in the greenhouse management world. So we talk about it a lot in this week. We do. It's probably the least sexy thing to talk about when you're talking about greenhouses, but <laughs> it's, it's necessary. Hey, you do what you got to do, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Then session seven is dealing with the elements. Would this be where snow comes in? Yes. Yeah, definitely. So we, you know, we've lost a greenhouse to the weight of snow and we know other, other growers who have. So just talking about what are the things, what are the weather events that you need to watch out for? You know, if you've got one end open and the other one closed, then you're just creating a big kite for wind to catch. So just kind of thinking about airflow and, and the weight the weight of snow, definitely. So there's some video of us, yeah, scraping the greenhouse off and things like that, so. Awesome. Sanitation is sex session eight. Which is another big thing, just like we're talking about ventilation. So you don't 
all of these things it's like when you first put up your greenhouse you you might not have pests and diseases and soil health issues in the beginning because it's brand new you know but then right. you know what to watch for as things develop so for us the sanitation is a big part of like not carrying disease over from fall into next spring so especially if they're heated and they're not like you know it's not killing killing the pests and diseases by freezing out because it's staying staying heated so the bug like aphids you know can be a can be a big issue if they're hiding under the table or under some weeds um right so keeping it clean is really important yeah all right and then session nine is what we've learned about humidity and venting from our conservation innovation grant grant Mm -hmm. So that's something that we're still um, in the process of the grant um, right now. And so the idea with that is to create um, like greenhouse systems for small scale sustainable farms that are transferable. So just kind of to add on to this class, like, you know, actually creating data that can be transferable, talking about at what temperature do you actually you know, open the greenhouse. And yeah, we've learned a lot about humidity, Steve. We've got greenhouse uh, monitoring systems that track that. And so for us, because we're so cloudy in Ohio in the winter, um, regulating the humidity in there is a big deal because it also has to do with disease issues. And yeah, so it's just sharing a little bit about what we've learned and talking about are uh, the soil, soil steaming, which we go into more detail in week six about that too. So, and that's where we are. We're at week six, pests, disease, and soil management. And it looks like there's several handouts for that one. Um, many of them from the universities that you guys, I know, work hand in hand with them a lot of times on different things. And so session one is diseases. Yeah. So we, we split it up. Um, these are diseases that we've dealt with. So again, these are all things that we've learned, learned the hard way and figuring right. out um, how to deal with them um, with organic practices in mind. So, you know, we're not certified, but our goal is to use the organic things first and, right. um, you know, use the conventional things kind of as a last resort. And that's why uh, working with the university, like with the lab is helpful. We can send stuff to them and confirm, right. um, confirm what's going on in there. And so that's how we've learned about a lot of these diseases is, um, you know, the plant pathology lab coming out and, and talking to us about our greenhouse management practices and other things that can lead to uh, the buildup of diseases in your greenhouse. So that's what session one and two are about diseases. Then session three and four is about pests from aphids to thrips to cutworms. To, I mean, there's a whole bunch of them listed here. Yeah. Yep. So those are all ones that we struggle with. I, um, you know, I know that there are other ones out there for growers and other climates, but um, aphids being the biggest one for us, um, especially in those shoulder months when it's cold outside, but it's warm, getting warm mm -hmm. in the spring in the greenhouse, you can really have some aphid explosions in there. So, you know, we talk about, um, later, I think it's week six, we talk about scouting. So I'll wait until we get there, but that's been a really big, important part of dealing with pests and diseases and the management side. And I think this is such a great one, session five, our worst weeds and weed cultivation. And then you've got those, you're listed here that y'all fight chickweed, thistle, bindweed, thistle, lamb's quarter. Um, I mean, that is, I mean, the weed thing is what takes so many people out. If disease and pests don't get you, the weed <laughs> will push you over the edge. Yeah, that's why we do this week last, because we're like, let's talk about all the fun stuff and get people excited to grow. And then we'll do the week about pests and diseases and soil management and stuff, because it is it is a lot to think about. And but I think that that's also why it's good that they have access to it like forever. Yes. They can come back to the class. So if week six is above, you know what I know, sometimes still, even if I go to a conference, if, you know, a science the scientist is giving the presentation and they get too detailed. Sometimes it's a little 
over my head. But then if I have an issue with that pest, then I can use that as a reference to go back right. to that, you know? So, um, that's the goal with these is just to kind of like provide the information of like, here's what this pest looks like and what you're looking for or what this disease looks like. So that way, when something happens with your plant and you're trying to figure it out, then you know um, that there's a resource to come and check against. So very, very true. Um, session six is integrated pest management, scouting and beneficial insects. Yeah. So in the winter, especially we're going through and scouting like once a week. So the idea is to be preventative rather than reactive. So just making sure that you've got an eye on all the plants um, and then using the beneficial insects as a proactive measure. So therefore you're using those instead of like, you know, instead of having to spray for things when things get really bad. So um, the beneficial insects have really helped with the thrips pressure. So that's, that's the biggest um, one that we use beneficials for. And then, so session seven is a continuation basically of that, of how you, with treating, with trying to use organic practices in mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's, you know, there are some new things that are conventional that are coming out right now, but that work with beneficials or, you know, th think about that. So, um, yeah, so we're always thinking about, oh, if we're going to put out beneficials, then, you know, when, when do you spray before you release them? Or what do you spray to make sure that you're not um, killing the beneficials in there as well? Right. And then session eight is soil tests and amendments. I think that is a key piece for a lot of people that they're missing that yeah. information. And I think that like, you know, people ask us all the time, like, well, what fertilizer do you use or whatever? And yeah. it's like, I can't really give you the answer to that. You know, it's all based on your soil type and what your soil test says that you need. And for us, like we've got multiple different soil types, even like with in our farm. So it's like possible that, you know, the greenhouses need something different than what the fields do. Um, so just thinking about that, or if it's a greenhouse that's been in production for longer than the other houses, it might have more needs than, um, than, you know, what a new house would. I think one of the things that is just so helpful, I'm just sitting here thinking about the overview of these last few classes that we're talking about I think sometimes people don't realize how they can reach out to their extension agents and to the universities that those people are waiting for people like us to come to them with a problem. Right. Mm -hmm. And they think that's that they're not big enough for that or they you know what I mean? They just and I think here yeah. and, and, and listening to y'all talk about how you've done it and how much it helps. I think it really gives people the confidence to reach out and make use of so many resources that are just beyond our door. We, but we have to go ask, you know, they don't know to come to us. Um, so I think that is just super great. And I think soul testing is right there at the top of the list. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, you know, like we, I think if you send something to the lab, the plant pathology lab here, it's like $20 or $40. Like it's not like you're paying hundreds of dollars for tests. Right. Like right. they're, it's accessible. And um, yeah, most people have a university or extension agent, like that's close to them. So. And, and it, then, it, a lot of times it's finding the right extension agent and that's going to take trial and error. And, you know, a lot of people are extension agents aren't going to be that helpful. Um, right. Just because they don't know about cut flowers well, and stuff. Yeah. yeah. But you ask them like, Hey, do you have someone you suggest or is there someone you recommend that works you know, uh, one of the extension agents that we work with is an organic vegetable producer uh, or focuses on organic vegetables and high tunnels. But but I use him as a resource because, um, well, it took me a while to find him. Um, and right. then I use the resource because some of the stuff is I can go back and forth. But, but if I was to call Fairfield County, you know, the next county over and ask them, um, nobody there is going to be able to help me. So, so it just takes time to find the right person. And once you do, they're more than willing to help. Right. Um, right. Don't be, don't, don't be Scared discouraged. Yeah, yeah. Don't be discouraged by the, yeah. you know, the first couple of people aren't very helpful because mm -hmm. that's the norm. And then session nine, which is the last session in the last week is soil steaming for disease and weed management. 
Yeah, so soil steaming is something that we started after we had issues with disease and we're working with Ohio State um, and they had originally told us to replace all the soil in our greenhouse, which was not really a sustainable option. So um, soil steaming is something that they used to do uh, back in the 70s and and earlier than that um, before people started fumigating and we knew we didn't want to fumigate with chemicals. And so soil steaming became the option for us. So we started it for disease management, but it does also kill the winter weeds, the chickweed and um, gallon, like gallon soda. It kills, kill gallon soda. Weeds, yeah. yeah. Um, it doesn't really kill thistle. It does kill thistle. Yeah. yeah. A little bit, it but um, <clears throat> so yeah, that's something that we share. And, you know, since we've been talking about soil steaming, there's been a few other growers that have have gotten steamers and have started that process. So I know that there's some growers that are kind of sharing sharing it with farms around them um, since it is a more expensive. But for us, it was like once we've been growing in those houses for eight, 10 years, you know, there was there was some buildup in there that needed to be addressed. So we couldn't do a whole um, six week class on greenhouse management and not talk about soil steaming though. So we had to include it, even <laughs> though- you are. <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I think that, you know, Gretel's already mentioned it. And one thing that people, especially when you're first starting, and of course, you know, you're so overloaded with information, you can't hardly begin to take it all in. The thing I love about online courses that are different than going to a conference is that you do get to go back and rewatch these courses over and over as your business grows and develops, right? I mean, it's like, this may not be your problem today, but two years from now, when your soil gets diagnosed with that disease, it may be very helpful for you. So yeah. um, I really appreciate you guys taking the time to run us through the syllabus to help us kind of get a better understanding of what exactly is included and how much information that you guys share in this course. So I really appreciate it so much. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, I hope that, um, you know, people find this information that like needed. And I think that, yeah, season extension is something that more folks will be getting into as the demand in the floral industry grows. So, yeah, I totally thanks. and completely agree. And yeah. um, so, all right, you two, I'm going to let you get back to farming and We'll talk again soon. Okay. All right. Bye. Thanks. Thanks. See ya. Thanks. Was I kidding? I mean, they cover everything. Um, and what they don't cover, if you have that question, you just ask it in one of their Q&As. So here's the lowdown on the course. Um, as all of our school courses, they only enroll once a year for five days. Because our classes, our courses are so interactive with the instructors and the students, that's why it's only offered once a year. I mean, most of our instructors are still active, full-time farmers. And so this course enrolls um, mid-November for five days. And then the school actually starts in January and runs for six weeks. And what that means is, is that every week at the first or whatever week, um, day this course delivers in your online library when you log in there's a whole nother week's worth of sessions in there and until you get all six weeks courses or sessions in your library um, they just you get more and more information and here's the gift of this y'all you own that content in that library, meaning you can go back and watch it as often and as many times as you want. So what this means is that if you're just starting out and this course overwhelms you, especially when you get to the pests and the disease problems, that may not be a real big problem for you the first year or even the second year growing, but it's going to be in your future. How awesome is it that you can go back to this course, to those specific sections, and re-watch them and re-familiarize yourself? That's part of what I love about online courses. As your business grows, you can revisit the courses you've taken to get the information that you may not even have realized was in there the first time around because you were busy listening to another part or focusing on another part. 
So if you want to learn more about the class, you can head over to thegardenersworkshop.com, go to the online courses, um, and Gretel and Steve's course is there. And if their course isn't currently open for enrollment, you can sign up to get on the wait list. This means two things. One, we'll send you emails when enrollment opens. We won't let you miss it. But Steve and Gretel also make resources that we send out to the people that have signed up for their special list from time to time. And so you will automatically get those resources when you're on that list. So friends, I hope this has been helpful and I hope to see you in school and happy farming. Ciao.